So, um, I am both a visual artist and an academic. And today I'm going to be talking a little about both aspects of my practice as a way of demonstrating how academic research and writing can feed into a creative practice. And you all have creative practices. Um, I'm, I'm talking about art, but architecture is also a creative practice. Um, and um, the, the title of this talk, Words as Objects, comes from the two basic, basic principles of what I do. Firstly, as a visual artist, one of my main mediums is books. That is, I make artist books. Okay, so these are not binded drawings or prints or, cat or catalogs which document existing work. Um, but they're editioned and published books. Um, in these, I write forms of fiction, for example, adapting novels, creating narrative structures, experimenting with different forms of writing. Um, and I also design the books. Okay, so depending on the content, these can be sculptural, as I will show in a glimpse of some of my recent and past works. Um, but I'll just show you right now. Okay, so you can see <laughs> some of the books in, uh, in the top two shelves, some of my, um, my most recent book, 20,000 Leagues and the Seas. So I've, I've rewritten the whole novel, and I'll talk a bit more about it later, but it also becomes <laughs> a very, um, it can also be a sculpture that can be shown in the gallery um, that does lots of different things. Um, so, so just to stress, um, artist books is, a, is a, actually an increasingly normal media um, that uh, it, gets, it gets shown in exhibitions and museums. And if it is sold, it'll be sold through the, the people that sell art, not necessarily publishers. Um, like uh, Macmillan or such like. Okay, so um, this is a rather tr literal translation of words as objects. Um, the string of words that make up my fictional narratives and subjective prose, uh, which I authored, become contemporary art objects. Another reason words as objects is, re is a relevant title in, is my broad theoretical base, which also forms part of my practice. In my academic theory, I take an object-based approach. By this, I mean that I look at the object itself as an analytical tool that can aid the researcher. In the case of buildings, um, I look, I see them as highly expressive objects whose current material situation, surfaces, and surrounding growth have a great deal to tell about their meaning. That is, I look at the thing itself as a way of allowing it to tell its own history. Some of my thinking around this is based in recent developments in contemporary theory relating to ecology and politics. So um, some of the writers, uh, Anna Singh, Jane Bennett, uh, but I also look at seminal texts like Aryan Apadurai's The Social Life of Things, and Kwame appears in my father's house. Some of my methodology is also instinctive as a visual artist used to analyzing, deconstructing, and making objects within context. So I don't eschew looking at the writing of architects or the original plans of buildings, but they are not my only source. Okay, so I still do the archival work. Um, if it's possible, but I don't, um, I don't see it as the only work to be done. And um, the reason for this is purely practical. Um, my main interest is in, uh, in buildings post-independence in Africa. I've, I've only really looked at uh, some sub-Saharan African countries, or I'm in the process of looking at them. And there are often just simply no records. Um, 
in Kinshasa, where I did my PhD research. Um, the, the city's archives were largely uh, destroyed or looted in urban un unrest that took place. Um, and um, I, I, I don't, I didn't feel this was a reason to not uh, look at buildings that were very interesting. Um, I, th I think that sites can tell their own stories. Um, and also, it, it's, it's a point of issue for me because, um, because often when there's missing documentation, many architectural and art historians do not study difficult sites, um, which means that important African sites, extremely important within the countries themselves, are not known um, within the canon of architectural history. So um, I, I think that's a situation that needs to be rectified. And I think that's what you all are doing as well. Um, but largely, I, I just don't really stick to disciplinary strictures, um, which I, I, I also uh, do on purpose. Um, so uh, I'm going to explain my approach with uh, two examples of sites um, that were from my PhD, and they're also going to uh, be in my book, um, which Huda was um, which Huda kindly announced, um, and that's based on my doctoral thesis. But you have to change quite a lot when you when you make it into a big book. Um, Thanks, Luto. And so, um, as I, I just go through two examples, very briefly, um, I'm going to also give quotations from my book. So just broadly before I, uh, I'm going to just take very short ep excerpts from my book rather than uh, not quoting myself. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, just give a, a quick summary of what the book's about um, to give you a sense. Uh, so my intention is to look at the state architecture of two major regimes that do dominate the story of the Congo. Okay. So I, I am looking at Kinshasa's urban space. And um, the book begins with a post-colonial critique of distinct early Belgian colonial architecture from approximately 1809 to 1910, with a particular focus on prefabricated structures that were sent to the Congo. I discuss the effect of colonial modernism on Kinshasa's urban space in order to lead towards the first examples of architectural self-representation in the commissions of the government after independence in 1960. Um, so uh, the two major regimes that I look at are that of King Leopold II, followed by that of um, Mobutu Sese Seko in the post-independence era. In both cases, the leaders have the reputation of being violent and despotic rulers. I saw my work as drawing out what the original political intentions of the buildings were, um, but also looking at their current meaning or their significance at the time of my research. In doing so, I tried to understand um, some of the seduction and promise of these sites and what their aesthetics brought to the public at the time. Um, and not only um, consider the incredibly harsh uh, political conditions, which of course still feed into um, the discussions that I conduct. And um, because there were few archives, those that existed were in Belgium, um, I, um, I spoke to a lot of people, as well as looking at the sites themselves. Uh, so I conducted a lot of interviews formally and also listened to informal conversation. Um, I'm really interested in oral histories and urban myths and things that aren't written down. 
um, even though I do refer to Congolese scholars when, when they have managed to pr produce publications. Okay, so let's look at pictures. The first image is of the hotels um, Alimentation de Bac Congo. My French is appalling. The, the nickname for them was the, the, uh, the ABC hotels, which is what I'm going to refer to them, or how I'm going to refer to them. So what you're seeing there, prefabricated structures that were sent from Belgium uh, to the Congo and erected during the period of 1904 to 1908, approximately. I'm looking at the tasteful one here. There was another one also erected in Kinshasa, um, which was then Leopold, well, in 1911. Okay, so these were kind of ready-made hotels whose purpose was to accommodate colonial travelers frequenting the first railway established in the Congo. This was the Matadi Leopoldville Line. The um, iron frameworks of the hotel were manufactured in, uh, in a factory um, in Antwerp. And so there's no architect, there's no record of an architect. There's only um, evidence of the factory um, having made them. And we, we don't have much else about them except a few photographs and postcards and writing by a Belgian travel writer who <laughs> describes going to these hotels and having a very luxurious experience within the very hot, dusty, and um, for, for him, very uncomfortable, a greater environment of the early Congo colony. And you can hear already how Congolese people themselves uh, were, are treated within these kinds of archives. This particular hotel came with a whole village, less, that's less ornate, which we'll, we'll look at in a moment, of prefabricated workers' housing. And I mean, this is only for the European workers. Um, there, there's no thought given to the people that were actually living um, in what's actually called Mbanza Ngungu, um, and the real name has been uh, reverted back to today. And you can see in this image um, the kind of postcard picture that's being sent back to Belgium by early settlers. And that's this complete rural, idyll, beautiful landscape, not populated, empty and luscious, uh, just ready to be mined for its, its natural materials. You know, even if some other point of view were taken, the, the reality of that situation would uh, be shown as very different. Uh, another postcard, and I included this one because it has these beautifully manicured lawns in front of the tasteful hotel ABC. And um, that means someone is pretty much on a daily basis having to snip those lawns. Um, it's the tropics, it's Central Africa, and uh, it's, while nothing's, there's, there's no evidence of it, it's fairly obvious what needed to happen and how much work had to go into this um, kind of statement of European occupation and luxury. And um, just a note on these buildings, they were produced by a factory whose product range extended to yachts and steamers. Um, they, they became, to a certain extent, um, they, another sophisticated means of taking the colonial mission further afield. Not only did they represent highly desirable, specialized items in the roughshod frontier environment of the colony, but also tools with which land could be claimed more effectively. When the most advanced piece of iron at the time was paraded in the colony for the exclusive use of the minority colonial community, and there were about, I think, 2% of the people in Congo at the time. Um, in this case, this luxury overpowered local dwellings that were made from natural materials. The hotels were not only instruments of lopsided, the lopsided socio-political cultural relations, 
but also made them plainly visible. Manufactured with the tropical environment in mind, the hotel was designed with an iron exoskeleton of balconies and stairwells. Um, the structure, structural metalwork embellished with decorative details was intended to serve as a buffer zone between the hotel's interior and what, for its makers, um, would have been the outside unknown. In an early example of, tropic, of colonial tropical arch architecture, the shaded area of balconies protect the inner chambers from what was, to Europeans, untenable heat and an unfamiliar landscape. However, the iron was to start a process of deterioration from the time it was laid into the soil. So when you, um, what I see when I look at these balconies is um, what must have happened during the colonial um, period, whereby guests at the hotel, um, all of whom were businessmen um, working out uh, schemes um, for extracting raw materials from the Congo, um, the balconies would serve as a space from which they could look down from the metal terraces at their leisure. Um, so the safety of the um, airy, comfortable hotel um, would also give them the safety to look out with control over the landscape. Um, it would also, because there's outside staircases, it would also mean that whatever business the servants had to do, and I'm, I'm using that word, um, because that's how they were considered, um, they would have to do that visibly. So their servitude would be exposed to the population constantly. Okay, uh, today the, the, the former ABC, ABC hotel is the local courthouse. You can see that the balconies are painted in um, some bright colors, even though the dust has uh, coated it. And those are the colors of the, uh, the Congo's flag, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which it is today. Um, and even though that paint has been thickly applied, it's a strong enamel, um, the paint is, um, it's, it's already peeling off almost from the minute it goes on. The, the, the iron's not doing well at all. Um, and uh, what you can see as you look out there is, um, is a defunct uh, railway station, which um, was the purpose of the hotels in the first place. So the metal of the iron hotels is linked to the railway on which they themselves were brought. And, and with them, they brought the complete devastation of not, of not only the um, existing inhabitants of Mbanza and Gungu, a very um, lively market which was there previously, but also um, the complete destruction of the environment due to, um, due to the um, it, like, agricultural industrialism which um, really uh, all but destroyed and um, spoiled what was the most fertile land in, in the Congo Basin, by all accounts. And so um, they, the, the station and the, the trains, um, I mean, these are just train carcasses at this point, and the and the rusted metal of the uh, metal structures today are still linked permanently in a way that even though the function of the building has changed, it can't escape that. And, and the, 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 that structure of metal around the, um, the, the houses, um, it, it, it's, it's, although decorative, still links to the railway and, uh, and to that uh, traumatic history of that railway, which I, I don't have time to go into. Just wanted to note that um, whereas the previous 
uh, in its former life when this structure was the Hotel ABC, it formed a, a symbol and even a warning of the extreme segregation of the colonial city to come. Uh, today, it's, um, it's, it's more open. Um, the manicured lawn is overrun by paths made naturally by people walking over. Um, a very pungent smells and sometimes and quite lovely smells uh, from uh, the uh, this kind of cafeteria that you see on the left uh, that you see in the photograph. You're going to have to find it um, where the where the there's um, there's a lunch and food stall, and and there, there's a real real liveliness to to the whole site, and there's a really a real sense of it being used and um, used thoroughly. At the same time, it's um, it's not ideal. It's not a great courthouse. The rigidity of the iron, even though it's crumbling and nature's taking over in places with where rust becomes a whole living surface, as does moss and damp. The offices inside um, are something that's uh, that, that's not designed for, for office work. Um, there's a real problem with uh, having to conduct official business of the court within them, uh, within what were actually little bed chambers for um, a, sleeping, um, a sleeping hotel guest. And I wanted to give you one more example of this way of working. Um, here you can, these, these are images from the, the workers' village. And you can see more of that encroachment of nature. But you can also see a subsistence farming as opposed to um, a carefully tended lawn. And um, I don't, um, I wanted to show you another example um, of one, one more site. And I'm going to go through this one quite uh, quickly, um, but just as, a, as an offset to. Um, the early colonial. This is a this is the uh, Recomines Tower. Um, I'm going to say Jacomines. Uh, used to be which used to be the uh, Sozocom Tower. This was built by Mobutu um, after independence as a site of the National Mining Corporation of the Congo. It was then called Zaire. I'm calling it the Congo for our purposes here today. So, um, this is in Uptown Kinshasa, which has many skyscrapers. And it's the most conspicuous one because it is as wide as it is, um, as much as it is tall. And um, it was designed by Belgian architects uh, commissioned by the Mobutu regime. And important to note that at this point in this post-independence era, which um, in, other, in the rest of Africa was around 1960 and in the 1960s, our, our independence is, is much later in 1994. But I know, I know a lot of you are interested in uh, pre and post-independence architecture. But now we're in in the process of directly after independence, and, and that was a violent independence, and it's still Europeans being commissioned to um, build the buildings, but they are doing it to the specifications of the new African government. Okay. And um, while this looks like a very sleek building um, on the surface, um, and in certain areas, it has an, quite a bizarre and novelesque biography that 
one experiences only through um, visiting it. And, and just a note, um, I, with most of these sites that I visit, I'm, I'm, they're strictly forbidden. Photographs aren't allowed. I had to get a journalist um, pass, and even then, taking a photograph had to be negotiated. Um, and it, it's just too weird to hear that an art historian wants to look at a building. Um, or an artist wants to look at a building, it, it seems suspicious as it seems like nonsense and an excuse to see a very, um, a very choicely positioned government site, especially the site of banking. So um, as a self-contained domain with its own power supply, uh, Jacobin's tower has clear hierarchies of space between the lush lobby and upper reception area are mundane, rundown offices, which, which I couldn't get into photograph. I had to pretend to be an engineering student. So they would show me the in, inner workings of the building. It's these crazy pipes and um, the whole system of the, the generator and the air conditioning. However, within the office spaces where the ordinary workers have to work, um, it's plain walls, plastic chairs, chipped wooden desks. There are no computers in most Congolese bureaucratic spaces. Um, so there's this switch from the outward appearance of an international corporate powerhouse. Um, the building holds all the dully worn aesthetics that characterized an impoverished bureaucratic operation. And then, so you get these gorgeous views looking out. Um, from this, uh, uh, the skyscraper. But you also get a sense of the history of, um, of the building. So this building is in full view of um, the capital city of Braza Congoville across the river. They're, they're the closest two capital cities in the world. Um, and what you see in that hole there is actually a cannonball from a time when, um, when the two countries were warring. Um, so th th this, this a kind of the fortress that is this building becomes quite clear when you realize only the outer section would be affected in a full out wall. And then the main building is still quite safe. Um, the building, becomes uh, more strange. Um, the once luxurious apartments on the uppermost floors now stand deserted and dirty. So these used to be like the penthouse apartments where um, visiting businessmen would stay. The carpeting is ripped up. And in one small room, I found a pile of abandoned furniture topped by a hunting trophy, which occupies um, which was, is said to have been occupied by one of Mobutu's sons, um, which, which is just bizarre uh, to me. Um, the adjoining hall with high sloped ceilings and long windows was once the scene of opulent balls where high society danced while overlooking the river and across to Brazzaville. Partly abandoned chambers with an architectural grandeur lended the air of a Gothic mausoleum. And um, this is the, this kind of scenario, each with its own bizarre idiom psychocratic um, biography, um, it can be found in all of the major, incredibly bombastic sites built by Mobutu. Um, and here's another, uh, its nickname is Le Changier, uh, which means the exchange. It's named after the roundabout, the traffic roundabout, um, a major one that circles it, making it this island of, of empty space. Um, just for another example, across the sides, spaces have been looted, walls are pockmarked and scarred, the glass clouded and cracked. Yet visitors must wait for hours to request permission to enter, enter independence era enclaves and follow a strict protocol once inside. 
Despite the everyday city encroaching, the rituals of respecting state, uh, state hierarchies are maintained, leaving them to deteriorate in parts, but well maintained in others. So in Gombe, where the Jacomines Tower is, um, an apartment currently costs more than $5,000 a month, and there are these vacant, vacant huge spaces with prime views. And then uh, this building, Le Changer, um, is also strangely empty in one of the most densely populated suburbs in Kinshasa. Um, and and, and it, it forms quite an eerie island in a congested area. So, sites like Le Changer and Jacquemines hold an ambiguous position. While their modernist frames tell of autarkic complexes of wealth and progress, their partial degradation means that they cannot do the aggrandizing work for which they were intended. Yet these locations still enjoy a certain aura of mystique permeated by nostalgia. However idiosyncratic and run down, the living shells of authenticity enchantment um, or independence era enchantment not only still stand but manage to pose a threat. Monuments to a political moment that failed its people continue to reach past the present to a terrifying, spectacular, disembodied future. And there's a difference between what the ABC hotels, which are also um, both holding together and falling apart in ways, um, and what the independence era buildings do. So, with the ABC hotels, their nostalgic pivot is for an ebbing embodiment of a distant colonial metropole, rendered increasingly frail as urban centers grow larger and more unpredictable in the African state. However, where aging colonial remains speak of an indistinct and rigid concept of Europe, the sites of Mobutu's post-independence in, in the post-independence point to a never realized fantasy of Africa. Okay, so um, I'm reading these excerpts because uh, it links to the idea of words as objects. It's obviously very descriptive and based in what I'm seeing. But, and I, it's something I take from art. I, I, in, in my artwork, I try and find the right form for the concept I'm talking about. And um, I try to do the same with my academic writing. So th these are very dramatic spaces, hugely dramatic spaces. That, that tower we're looking at right now is, um, is as, as tall as the, the Carlton Center, um, which you all know. And, um, so the writing's also quite moving with those forms um, within reason. And um, it's also very subjective and obviously subjective. And I'm not pretending to be some uh, separate analyst um, who's not in the situation, which I, I just think is just honest as well. Um, so uh, it's, it's also, it, it's clear these are my impressions and my discussions and my research. Um, and I'm not trying to speak on behalf of anyone or trying to lay down facts. Sticking to, to words as objects and as I start talking about my art and I'm going to move into, um, I'm going to move into uh, showing you just a very, very short, um, selection. I'm going to first answer a few question, uh, question that I'm always asked uh, to preempt what you might ask. So um, why am I a, a visual artist and a practicing visual artist um, writing a, a theoretical PhD on the Congo? And um, I'm including this because um, I, th I think it's often, well, in my experience, it's useful um, for you guys as, uh, as architects, as creative practitioners, as designers, to hear. I was living in Belgium on a two-year artist residency, 
Um, and so I'll, it's this place called the Hisk. I can tell you about it if you want to hear. Um, and uh, my motivation for writing the theoretical PhD was that um, I found living in Brussels very strange uh, in the sense that the colonial history is completely um, silenced um, and the violence of the particular um, colonial regime of King Leopold II, which was notorious and supposedly the worst colonial regime, which has its own problems. Um, but nevertheless, um, there, there, there's still uh, statues of King Leopold the Seventh, uh, the Second, glorifying him. Up, and I wanted to talk about that situation in more subtle ways. And I actually, um, and what I found was the style Art Nouveau, in which the hot, uh, the ABC hotels are in, which Brussels is famous for. It's called the Art Nouveau capital of the world, and um, you probably covered it in architectural history. Um, but every single one of those, uh, the famous landmark Art Nouveau sites in Belgium, uh, the money can be traced back to, um, to uh, colonial, uh, colonial industry. Um, so that's why I started um, looking at the Congo, uh, looking at the Congo, becoming interested in the Congo. I, and when, while I was making this work, uh, this artwork about Art Nouveau, and this is the kind of stuff I was making at the time, that's up on the screen. Um, while I was making this work, I realized I didn't have enough of the theoretical depth um, that I wanted in order to talk about this highly complex situation. So that, that's why my PhD was in theory, and also why I went back to, back to the continent and back to South Africa, and um, uh, going uh, studying in Joburg at Weiser, I realized um, I really needed to focus more on Kinshasa than Brussels, because I've, I've, I've grown a fatigue uh, with only critiquing the colonial. Um, I'm interested in the complexities of um, African self-representation. So, um, uh, the kind of work I was doing was, it's called interventionist. Um, so, literally putting things in the city and even more obviously words as objects. I, I, I did a lot of text pieces. If you, if you guys are interested, you can look at it. It's, um, it's very uh, uh, humorous work, I think. Um, and um, while I was in Belgium, I started my book works. And again, I, I can talk in more detail about any of these. This was the first one, False Friends. It was a rewriting of um, Edgar Allan Poe's murder, Murders at the Rue Morgue. Um, but I, I changed it to set it in Antwerp in contemporary times as a way of talking about um, the riots uh, uh, by largely Islamic immigrants um, in, I think it was about 2007, 2008, um, to talk about that situation. This is an extended alphabet, which um, is about the architectural forms of the city of Utrecht. Uh, and um, I, I, I was looking at a lot of bestiaries from that city at the time this sort of ancient form of encyclopedias and um, which described like fantastical beasts like uh, mermaids and um, all sorts of uh, creatures we think are fabulous monsters but are really just ordinary things like half an animal half a human um, and you can see how they came about so I, I made my own fantastical uh, encyclopedia, my own theory of all the buildings and man-made structures in Utrecht that I found interesting, but I described them as if they were living creatures. And 
uh, we can come back to this if you want. It, it was just um, an example of still treating book works as interventions. This particular piece um, was when I, I was in, uh, on a residency um, at the ZKM Museum in Karlsruhe, in a godawful southern part of Germany, uh, Bavaria. And um, uh, I actually made the, the piece into something that could be di distributed. There wasn't much in the gallery itself, but I took out um, some space in a uh, well-known, uh, in, in the main newspaper there to publicize the work. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk too much about the work now. Um, because I'm, 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 I'm keen to talk about correlations between academic work and, um, and uh, artistic practice. So this is what I was making at the start of my PhD, the book you saw already. And um, this was attempting my first attempts to talk about Art Nouveau. And um, I was rewriting and for this book, I rewrote uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is a really, really popular book in Europe about, um, about uh, uh, wow, fantastical story by Jules Verne from the late 19th century about uh, this voyage in an imaginary submarine. And... Um, it's hugely colonial, it's hugely racist, but children imbibe this um, with their, uh, uh, with their, their, um, with their, their, their bedtime stories. So I made several interventions into the book. Um, and I took some liberties with the fact that they were being translated. And um, at the time they were translated to um, shift the politics of the book. Uh, in the original French version, the uh, British are very terrible, murderous people, which, which changes <laughs> when the book gets translated into English. And so I thought I'd put my own politics in. And I, I used Art Nouveau as a metaphor for colonialism. And I um, changed the design of um, the submarine. So I'm not drawing pictures here. I'm actually writing a book so that the descriptions are different. And, um, uh, and the various things that happen in the book and the, the uh, colonial attitudes and racist attitudes are drawn out and highlighted, but um, uh, in ways that are quite sculptural, I mean, um, I also uh, can't find an example now, but I, I would cross out um, those sections that were from the original book that were highly problematic to me. And the illustrations for the book weren't pictures, they were word pictures. Um, and they were the parts of the book that had also fallen away in the translations. And I thought they were quite beautiful. So. I wanted to communicate that. Um, so this is an example of purely critiquing the colonial. Um, and that is what I started to move away from in my PhD. And um, at the moment, and I, I'm working on a new book called Remainders. And it's going to look like a, a book like this. Um, and this is the things that kind of fell out of my PhD. Um, the things that I found fascinating and I thought about as much as my actual official case studies, but that don't really, um, but that didn't make any sense in my academic arguments or were just kind of anecdotes. And I wanted to make them the main event. 